Welcome to Ask Joe number... Two. Hello and welcome to another riveting episode of Ask Joe, also known as the Home Studio Corner Podcast, also known as the thing the the thing that Joe does live on Tuesdays where he kills mosquitoes live for people. It's pretty impressive. He was huge. And now we, I will not suffer anymore at his hand. So I hope you're doing well. Uh, this is episode 200 and I was hoping for a big shindig of some sort but uh i got nothing the only thing i do have that you may not have seen yet is i started what some people call a vlog i'm calling it gilder cam because now this thing follows me around and i make i make videos i mean i've been making videos for years but it's more of a daily vlog type thing where you're kind of a virtual internship where you come hang out with me and see what's going on, and I show you what I'm up to and all that fun stuff. Nothing else will change, so if you're only into the podcast and the th- two-minute tips or whatever, that's totally fine, or the mixed-together stuff. But if I, um, if you want to kind of dive in more into Joe land and see what I'm up to and uh, come hang out, then please do. It's on YouTube and Facebook. All right, so today what I want to talk about, since it is episode 200, I will do one special thing, and this will be kind of my rant for right now, and it is simply this. I want to talk about a few things, and I don't even have a number yet, that I've changed my mind on since starting this podcast. So in 200 episodes, over stretched out over the course of eight years, because it wasn't always weekly, uh, what, have I, what have I changed my mind on? Because I do a lot of... Um, do, I mean, I do a lot of talking, I do a lot of creating content and videos and whatnot, and clearly, there, there are time, we as musicians and as creatives tend to change our minds a lot, and I'll talk about a few of those, and you can still find videos where I'm promoting the opposite, so rather than take them all down, because there's no way I could find all the inconsistencies, it's kind of neat to see the trans, transition, or you may call it the evolution of of how I've thought about things, not because it's, it's not interesting because it's me, it's interesting because we all evolve in the way we approach things, just like I haven't always liked broccoli, now I think it's delightful, that, that kind of thing. So, thing number one, and this is the most recent and the most surprising to me, I have now fallen in love with Melodyne and Autotune. I used to play this, toe this line pretty hard, where if you need tuning software, you're not trying hard enough. And there is a whole lot of good truth behind that of you need to be a good performer, you need to be a good singer, you don't need to rely on tuning software to make you good. But the reality is no amount of tuning software will ever make you good, right? Tuning software will not change the fact that your vocal tone sounds the way that it does, right? Tuning software won't give you good tone and good vibrato and good control or good ideas as a singer. It just takes the pitch and moves it. So on my EP that I did back in February, where I recorded and mixed the whole thing in a month, by the way, I've got another one coming up in May, uh, which is literally right around the corner. So very excited about that. Part of that EP, I was so pressed for time, I had to do some tuning to just get the vocal. I had to sing the vocal and then just get it done, and it worked really well. And I'm really glad I've kind of moved into that game because it is a tool that I think is helpful. And we could we could debate this all day. You could tell me how I'm wrong or tell me how I've been wrong for so many years and I'm finally right. Don't really care either way. I still don't use it heavily. I still don't use it in a way that is super noticeable. A friend of mine asked uh, about the uh, acapella song that I released two weeks ago or a week and a half ago. If I he said clearly it sounds like you didn't use any tuning and I said no I actually tuned every single vocal in there so if you do it carefully and um, in a very musical way it's not something that's very obvious and it's certainly not a big like T pain effect type thing so that's number one changing my tune on tuning thing number two this is something I put a video out uh, I would say this was it was right after my twins were born so they're almost four so it's almost four years ago I put out a video. And I've been talking about this 
a long time prior to that. And the video simply said that one of the it was called one of the best mixing tips ever, which is one of those you know annoying titles that you have to click on because you got to figure out what it is. And essentially, what I and I admit I I've done that before. Essentially, what I said was. The, one of the best mixing tips I ever got was back when I was just getting into recording and mixing, and somebody said to always put a high-pass filter on everything but kick drum and bass guitar because there's potentially other low-end and low-frequency information down there that is going to interfere with your bass and is going to cause muddy mixes. And it was true for me at the time. I found myself that I it's not true for me anymore and a couple reasons. The main one being, that was true for me back when I was recording really crappy recordings. So when my recordings were muddy, yes, I needed a high-pass filter just to filter out some of the mud to make it less muddy. I wasn't recording things well. Microphones were too close to the guitars, too close to the voice, or, or no, the voice, I still like them close. But it was just a matter of not getting good sounds to start. So then the high-pass filter was more of a correction of a problem versus an actual mixing technique, if that makes sense. So since over the years of getting better at recording and really buying into this idea of I would love for my raw tracks to sound as exactly how I want them to sound in the mix after I record them and really being on a quest to make my recorded tracks sound that good, I found myself suddenly not needing those high-pass filters or getting to the end of mixes and maybe high-passing one or two things, and only because there was something specifically that I heard in the mix that I brought in a high-pass filter for. So that's thing number two. I do I no longer high-pass everything but kick and bass. I don't think it's necessary, and I think it can be just a waste of time, okay? Thing number three. Oh, I didn't... Dang it, I thought I had a three. I had it a second ago. Hmm. Okay, thing number three... I don't find editing to be as crucial as I once did. I still think it's a part of my process, but I used to say that the the recording process could be divided up into pre-production, recording, editing, mixing, mastering, those big five. And I feel like editing in the middle just doesn't deserve that much attention. It's important, and you have to do it well, and that includes things like tuning and pocketing and comping, but I, I don't, part of this, I don't do a lot of editing because I no longer record five takes of everything and then go back and comp them together. That seems fun when you're first getting into recording of having the singer sing five takes and then you can sit there until three in the morning listening to every part of every take and finding the perfect combination to make it amazing. But for me, I just probably half due to laziness and half due to a desire for efficiency. I've just gotten to a point where we sing it a few times until we get a good take and then we punch in the parts that need to be punched in and then we tune the parts that need to be tuned and that has been... Um, hugely helpful and time-saving for me because I'm not. Uh, it's there's nothing more demoralizing to me than, well, I just I hate wasting time. So having to spend several hours recording vocals only to know that I've got another several hours to go through those and edit them out, it, it does two things. One, it makes me not want to get in there and do that, which makes me not want to do this project anymore. Um, and then. On the flip side of that, it makes me not pay attention as well during the recording session because I'm thinking, well, she sung it four times already. Even if she didn't get it right, I'm sure there's one where she did. There's been plenty, so many times where I have five takes of a vocal and the singer has jacked up the same line in each one because we didn't stop and say, hey, you're singing that funny. Let's go back and fix that because we're thinking, oh, we'll just throw a bunch of takes down and put them together later. There's nothing wrong with that approach. It's not technically wrong, but man, I think golly, I love the time that I've saved and the intentionality that it brings to the recording session of not relying on so heavily on editing and getting it right on the front end. So those are my things. I hope that was um, maybe insightful or helpful or maybe gave you a little bit of freedom to not do some things that you've been doing. And if nothing else, just know that you can always evolve your opinion on this stuff. You can always change how you approach things. Uh, No one's going to stop you, and there's no reason not to. It's a part of the process. It's a part of growing as an individual and as a creative person. So get in there and change things up. Boom. All right. The rant went a little bit longer, but ah, who cares? I thought it was good stuff. Thank you, everybody who's here on the live chat. Um, Got a lot of familiar faces here. Even my buddy James Waddell. 
name drop. He's kind of my only real friend that has a Grammy, so that makes that makes it cool too. But I, I like you, James. Just Grammy or no Grammy, you're just a cool dude. But the Grammys are it's just cool to see him sitting behind you when we hang out. So anyway, we need to hang out and get tacos soon. That's not the point. Thank you, everybody who's here uh, at the live chat. By the way, if you didn't know, I do these podcasts every week live uh, at Tuesdays at 1 p.m. And you can join me on YouTube Live. A bunch of other weirdos join me as well. And we hang out. We talk. They're all being nice to each other in the chat, which is super fun. And then they ask me questions and I answer them. So that's where you want to go if you got yourself some questions. Also on Facebook, you can ask questions there, although more and more people just seem like they're just showing up for the live deal, which I love. But I did get one lonely Facebook question from Ian, and he says, I'm struggling a bit with my low-pass filtering. It's funny because I just got done talking about high-pass filtering. All my mixes come out too bright, especially on the cymbals and some high-range vocals. My ear tends to mix bright, and clients say my cymbals are always too loud. So I started to compensate by bringing a low pass up to around 10 to 12, excuse me, 10 to 12K, and then my mix sounded a bit muted on the high end. What are some low pass tips and tricks and or your chain to tame the high end of the mix, but still get definition in the cymbal work? Am I just using too much compression? FYI, I always start with master bus processing. Thanks, Joe. Ian, it's a really good question, and I wish I had like a specific, do these three things and you will never deal with this again. But in my experience, and I think a lot of people's experience, you go through this kind of continuum. When you get into recording, everything sounds muddy. And then you realize that you can EQ out the mud. And so you EQ out too much mud and now everything's harsh. And then you're on the journey of returning back to thick, good sounding mixes without being muddy and bright, clear sounding mixes without them sounding harsh it's a delicate balance and one that you will you will toe that line i've said that twice this episode uh for your entire mixing career because we're always fighting for balance that's what we do as mixers we balance things right we balance the tracks we balance the eqs we balance the frequencies we're all about balancing and nothing ever comes to us perfectly balanced so sorry my nose itches so we have to do some of that balancing ourselves that's why we're mix people so as far as advice for you, I think a, a low pass filter or a high cut filter is a little bit of an extreme solution. It can work, but it just takes off so much. And to me, I rarely have a high pass filter or a low pass filter work perfectly. It usually either feels like too much or too little. What I would say is if your cymbals are too loud, go turn your, turn your overheads down. That's the simplest solution. Symbols too loud, turn down the overheads. If turning down the overheads messes up your snare sound because you're getting a lot of your snare sound from the overheads, then go find the specific frequencies of the cymbals. It's probably around 5 to 8K maybe, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, and just go find that and boost it till you find the, the most annoying part of those frequencies when the cymbals crash, and then just bring that down, and it should smooth out the sound of the overheads. You'll still hear the crash sounds, You'll still hear them and they'll still come through, but they won't be as piercing and as harsh. That's one solution. Um, the other solution that I think is probably more likely is you just need to turn the overheads down. You just have them too loud. If you're doing a lot of compression on your mix bus, then try... This is something I've been doing lately is routing the overheads and rooms to a separate bus from the kick, snare, and toms so that I can do some aggressive compression on the kick, snare, and toms and it doesn't also add that compression to the overheads, which helps the cymbals not get so weird and washy or too bright or whatever. That might be a solution as well. Uh, also, if you're rolling off all the low end on your overheads and room mics, like everything below a thousand hertz you're rolling off, you're probably overdoing it and that's going to help make things too bright as well. Those are some solutions. It's certainly not an exhaustive um, answer to your question. I wish I had an exhaustive answer. Um, but those are some ideas. Someone in the chat, Nero said, try using a de -er. That could work. Um, I tend to find if I find the, the frequency that's annoying, I just bring it down and it just solves the problem throughout, but that's certainly an option as well. Ben Holmes, uh, he's a client of mine, actually. I'm working on, was recording some guitar for him yesterday and working on some today before the podcast, and I'll finish up after the second song is coming together well, Ben, by the way. I'm not playing exactly what you played, um, I think you should leave that arpeggiated part if you like it, because you played it well, and I, I don't think I could do it the same way. Um, but anyway, the, the tracks I'm laying down sound sweet, very big. Anyway, sorry, that was side note that no one else will get. 
Ben says, when tracking, any tips for encouraging musicians to put more performance into the playing? Sometimes uh, doesn't come across, acoustically sounds good, but missing the life of when they play live. Wow, that's a good question. This is something, so, it's, so okay, I'll answer that with a, with a, a little bit of a story. When, when I did the tracking day this past Friday, which if you haven't seen the video from that, it's uh, Gildercam episode four. It's called Tracking Day. Go look it up on YouTube. Uh, we, I brought in a friend to set up a bunch of cameras to video everyone while we did tracking to give a little more behind the scenes, let you see what we do because I talk about it and I sometimes live stream it with Facebook Live, but that doesn't give you the full picture. So it, my buddy Forrest did a great job putting that video together. Definitely go watch it. But one of the things Forrest and I talked about, Forrest is my video buddy, was if once the cameras turn on, one thing that he notices, if you don't address this, as people will be having fun and joking around, and then as soon as the cameras go on, they get very stoic and very calm and very safe. And that obviously comes across on camera. So he says it's important for whoever's running the session, me in this case, to make sure to encourage them to be themselves. And I think he even did that as well. Now, in this instance, these guys were almost ignoring that the cameras were there for the most part which was kind of fun. But in some situations, it might just be that when that recording light goes on, they're so afraid of making a mistake that they play it safe. They don't go for some of those riffs that they would normally go for. Or if you're a drummer, that that fill that you, you knock out all the time in practice, but you don't quite get it. You're too scared to try it in the recording. I get that. I do it myself. Depending on the day, I may hear something in my head for a section coming up, but I'm, I'd rather not mar my perfect take. And so I just play it safe. One thing you can do, obviously, a couple things. You can talk to them about it and say, hey, I would rather it have a lot of passion than be perfect. There have been plenty of perfect recordings out there that are just boring. So tell them, feel free to try stuff and go for stuff. If that doesn't work, what you can maybe do is let them record all stiff for a take or two until they get a good take. And then tell them, hey, just for fun, just so I have something to listen to later, I want you to play this one and just do all the stuff that maybe you want to do, but you don't do because you don't want to make a mistake. And, and kind of just play it up as if you're saying, I really just want something to maybe add in later, but I've already got your take. It's fine. Just, just for fun, lay another one down and just have a lot of fun. It Obviously, so many different personalities are going to respond differently to that, but you'd be, you'd be surprised at how when people think that they don't have to get it right, suddenly they like come to life. Or if they don't think you're recording, that's the funniest part. They're like nailing it when you're not recording and then you start recording and they stiffen up. You know, it's the case with everything. I remember a friend of mine was a pitcher in high school, really great pitcher. Um, but when he got two, two in his head, his pitching would suffer when he's really trying to like place the ball, <laughs> baseball right here. When he's really trying to like, instead of throwing the ball, he's trying to really kind of aim it and it just to get the his pitching would would lose he'd lose his control and the game would get worse and once he kind of loosened up again things got great so sometimes the coach would go out there and literally not say anything to him about pitching pitching he would go out to the mound and he would say hey see that cute girl over there and he he would look at him confused and say yeah he goes just just wondering if he saw her and he'd walk away and then he, they'd laugh and he'd kind of loosen up. And anyway, so <clears throat> any lots of different ways to loosen people up. But those are some ideas. I may have to break for water here in a second. This is why I need an actual intern and not just digital ones. So if someone can hand me. Anyway, Johnny Lipsham says to tell him, oh, this is just a rehearsal. I'm not recording. And then just record it anyway. That's awesome. Nothing like a little lying to get you going. I'm kidding. Um, Acoustics with two X's says, do you find it easier to mix on your own music compared to others? And if so, why? Yeah, it's both easier and more difficult. It's easier because I'm mixing along the way. So by the time I get to quote a mixing session, the song's halfway done anyway. So I'm really just going in and fixing things I haven't bothered to fix yet. The downside is obviously I don't have much of an objective ear for the music. So if there are glaring problems in the recording or the mix, and if I haven't heard them up until this point, then I'm probably not going to hear them in the mix session either. So there may be big flaws that I don't hear. Great example is if you go listen to from my latest EP, the EP is called Someone to Blame. Go listen to the song Comfort. And it's the first or second chorus. Um, it's the second or third line when I sing, we do what you tell us to. 
For some reason, I don't know why, that line got jacked up so loud volume-wise, and then the next line is way quiet, and it just sounds super awkward. Every time I listen to it, I just kind of facepalm because it was one of those things, either I must have, it must have been too quiet and I turned it up, but I turned it up too much, and then I never noticed it again um, the entire rest of the project, which I was pressed for time, so I didn't have tons of time to listen, but that's one of those things I anyone else would have listened and said, hey, that's too loud, turn it down, but I was so in the song and listening to everything, and I played everything but drums and bass that I'm listening to all these things that I've done, it's harder to hear it objectively. So those are some thoughts on that. I do still love mixing my own stuff. It's part of the creative process for me. Amon or Amon says, do you have any tips for songwriting? How to choose a melody for a song when you have lots of mediocre ideas for that one part or no idea at all? I don't know. I think melody is one of those things that I, 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 I wouldn't know how to teach it. Because I don't, I don't think I'm an expert. I think I just, I don't, I don't have a low tolerance for boring, just in general. Boredom and me don't get along. So if I'm writing a song and I don't love the chord progression, as in I could play that every night at a show, I move on. And it doesn't have to be something super intricate and crazy. It just has to be something that I enjoy playing. If if I was playing in a band and someone said, "Hey, let's play this song," and I thought, "Hey, great, I love playing that song." Those are the kind of songs I want to write. So once I've written the guitar part, then I've come up with a melody that does the same thing. It's something I enjoy singing, not something that feels like it's just filling space, uh, but something that has movement, something I could sing by itself and not only have to have the guitar to sing it. But other than that, I don't know, other than listening to lots of melodies. And if you're not a singer, become one. Even just sing along with your favorite songs in the privacy of your own studio just to get an idea of what melodies do. Singing them helps you understand them more. Um, and maybe even going back and listening to classical music or something and, and really f- listening to those melodies, you know, all classical music ends up sounding kind of the same from the same periods in some ways, but those melodies are really beautiful and something to listen to. For those of you who are having problems logging on, I'm sorry. Several people are saying they're having problems. My system says my stream is spot on, so I apologize. Let's see... Um, Tom says, I read an article recently about an engineer that hits record when the musicians get to the studio and records everything, even them setting up so nothing gets missed. Yeah, I think that was um, Vance Powell here in Nashville, or at least I've seen an article where he talked about that as well. It's a very cool idea um, because you may catch some magic, and it's great to go ahead and catch it. So yeah, I think that's great. (laughs) Natasha says, is it just me? It's just that there are so many YouTube channels and forums that you don't know even what to look for or how to start. Um, Yeah, I don't know what the context of that question is, but yes, there are, and I'm one of them. So, you know, find somebody you connect with. If it's Graham Cochran, if it's Bjergman Benedictson, if it's Rob Mazes, if it's Warren Hewitt, if it's David Glenn, Pete Woj. I mean, just find one that you connect with, just person, like you, you enjoy that person. And then I say just run with them. And, and just study their stuff as opposed to feeling like you have to follow everybody. And if that means you don't follow me anymore, that's totally fine. Um, I think it, getting to a point where you've got to spend most of your time just catching up on what everyone else is doing, and it's not something you would just do normally, but you feel like you have to do it because you're going to miss something, that's when I think you've gone too far down the rabbit trail. Lakshay says, the most difficult thing for me when mixing it's to listen to my song as a listen to my mix as a song. I keep paying attention to all the different instruments and details. Do you have any tips for that? I don't have any tips other than it's good that you're aware of it. Um, and as much as you can give yourself a reminder to kind of zoom out and think bigger about the project and listen to it as a song as opposed to individual components, it's really just a matter of making yourself do that a lot um, because that's what matters, right? Is what the final full deal sounds like. It doesn't really matter what the individual components sound like. They only matter in so far as they help you get to the point where the entire song sounds great. Does that make sense? Let's see. I'm trying to find out what Natasha was talking about. Okay, she was saying, how do I even start? I'm new to all this. I don't even know where to start. Um, it's It can be really overwhelming, Natasha, and I've been where you are. Um, it was years ago and there wasn't any YouTube, so in a lot of ways it might have been easier, but 
at the same time, I did lots of really, really annoying things that, um, or just lots of things I didn't know were wrong for years because no one was there to tell me. Um, I really would say just start as simple as you can. What do you like to do? What do you, why did you start getting into audio? What is it that you want to do? If it's record yourself playing guitar and singing, I would start with that. Get one microphone and just start recording and just record all the time. Watch videos when you can of people doing that thing you want to do. Don't worry about everything else you don't get. Don't worry about gain staging. Don't worry about mixing even. If it's just recording that you want to get into, just do recording. And and that's it. And then eventually you'll get a little bit better at recording and you'll want to know a little more about this mixing. Then you can come find information about that. But don't let yourself be overwhelmed because there's really no easy way out of that. I'm trying to catch up with the chat. Y'all are talking to each other a lot, which is great. Oh, here's one from my boy Stian from Sweden, I believe. How do you feel about adding a co-write component to the VIP membership? Let us bounce ideas off of you. And if your suggestions end up in the hit song, you get a songwriter's credit. That would be fun. I like the idea of co-writing. Or, or, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't care about the credit part as much as, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think it's an interesting idea. I think if more than just maybe a segment where people send their unfinished songs and I give ideas for finishing, a cool example is Ben Holmes, who's here on the chat, or at least he was earlier. The songs that I'm recording for him today, Electric on were songs that he sent me to critique after he'd recorded them. So he recorded the, some of the basic tracks and sent it to me to get feedback on the recording so he could go in and make some changes before he went to mixing and mastering and all that. And it was a really fun process. So I, you know, it, it talked about the guitar work and I didn't like this guitar tone and would probably prefer it to sound like this which eventually led to him hiring me to play it, which was cool. But another thing was there was one song in particular where I felt like the melody on the chorus, I, I had an idea of a way to make it better. And I just, as I was listening, I was just talking to the microphone, I just sang a different melody line. And for whatever reason, that really connected with him. And he loved it and added it to the song. And, it, and to me, it felt like it really took the song to a cool new level uh, that worked really well. Um, now, I'm not going to be hitting up Ben for a 50% songwriter split on that because that's just not the way I roll. But um, I do like that that idea of extra collaboration on that, on the more, the very, very front end. That's the thing I don't think I've talked about a lot is what it, is getting the song to a point where it's ready to record. Not just, um, oh, my camera did freeze. Oh, let's uh, try to fix that. I guess I can't. Interesting. Oh, the joys of the joys of live streaming. My my poor computer isn't meant to handle all of this. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I forgot what I was saying. I do like. I do think I could talk more about the front end. What needs to happen with the song before it ever is ready for, to record? Because that's something that a lot of you, I would imagine, are kind of left in the dark on, and can probably stand to hear more about. Um. Now they're all talking about my fro. Apparently, my face is frozen on the stream. Stian, I'm so sorry about the Norway Sweden thing. I, I'm sure, I sound like an ignorant American. My bad. Mm -hmm. Cool. Nero says, honest question: What's your take on using pirated stuff? If you go look, one of my more popular videos is one called "Why I Don't Pirate Plugins," and I give a little jab to the piraters, so just saying I don't think it. I personally don't think it's morally right to take something that's not yours unless it was given given to you but um and that's 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 my take on it your take might be different I, and i would rather not i just would rather not take something that's not mine so that's the first part of it second part of it is a lot of people want to pirate plugins because they're too lazy to actually figure out how to use the plugins that they have now, I understand that there are lots of plugins for making sounds, and a lot of the people who get angry at me on YouTube are 
more hip hop guys who are needing synths and things like that. That's a different thing. I get that you may need more sounds to make more sounds. Does that make sense? Um, but for us mix guys talking about EQs and compressors, if you can't get a good mix with the stock plugins, it may get a little easier to get a good mix with nicer plugins, but only if you know what you're doing to begin with. If you don't know what you're doing, it's not going to make things much better. Um, now, you know, somebody in the chat said pirated stuff sounds better, and that may actually be the case. I have found that the most massive improvements I've made to my music have been changes I've made to me, uh, and also changes to the front end. So microphones, preamps, guitars, amps, that stuff, or writing a better song makes a way bigger difference than which EQ I use um, on the front end. So I will say I do dig... Um, I do dig uh, getting creative tools. I'm not big on just getting like plugins for mixing. I just don't dig them that much. They just don't excite me. Um, so that said, I think if you're making a lot of electronic music, then yeah, you need to probably expand your music library over time. I still don't think pirating is the way you have to do that. People say they, they're cost too much. Try being a guitar player and you want a nice guitar amp, guitar amp, pedal board. Um, the, you know what guitar players do when they can't afford expensive guitars? They don't get them or they save up their money and they buy them and then they appreciate them and they use them really well. And in the meantime, they make great music with whatever they have available to them. They don't go steal a guitar because they can't afford it. I know th digital stuff isn't technically stealing because you're, you're not stealing a physical thing from them. And that's the argument people make. Or they say, I don't make money from this. Therefore, I can, I can steal it. I don't think that makes sense. I, if, if I don't make money from, you know cutting my grass should I steal a lawnmower no like it, it to me and I know that's different but at the same time it's the same so um th those are my thoughts you don't I'm not going to try to change your opinion that's just where I land on it I think f you know for one thing I I'm not so much interested in the companies getting their money I'm just more interested in only taking things that are intended for me if that makes sense on the same token, if I see where someone is trying to give away my paid stuff for free, I don't really just bother, right? Because I just, I just don't bother. I just don't care either way. I do think the the plug-in companies, this is just kind of a side note, I think the plug-in companies could stand to change their model. I think the reason Stephen Slate is becoming so popular is because he's changed the model of the plug-in world where it's a lot more subscription-based. You pay a low rate and get everything versus... You know, I think the days of the $10,000 plug-in bundle are going away because people are realizing they don't have to and um, and that they can get great plugins for a fraction of that price. So, yeah, I do think the plug-in companies should kind of pull their heads out of their butts and stop pretending like it's 15 years ago and realize that it's now in the same way that we musicians need to stop having this idea that the only way to make money as a musician is to sell albums. There are so many other ways to do it, but it requires work. And I think a lot of people aren't willing to do that. They're not willing to do the work. Are you using any plugins by Ian Shepard? Yeah, I use, um, me, what's it called? Um, not Dynameter. I've not used that one yet. I use Perception for mastering, but only sometimes. And uh, it's cool. It lets me hear before and after without changing the volume, which is pretty useful. There's a question about chords in here from Chris. Let me see if I can find it. Kind of went away on me. Music theory for writing a song that's in C, and instead of F, you play F minor for something different, or would just sticking to the major fifth be best overall? I'm not what you mean by major fifth, but yeah, I mean, th to me, that's part of what, when I'm writing a song, playing a chord that doesn't fit in that progression or in that key. So if you're in C and you play an F minor, that's going to be different, right? And it's probably going to make you want to go to a G minor and back to the C, which sounds a lot like playing an A flat major to a B flat major to C, which is the flat six, flat seven, one, which it's easy to overdo that. So you don't want to do that too much. I think that kind of stuff, if it happens once in the song or once in the verse, it's cool. If you do it too much, then it becomes too common. And then you kind of have to, now you're, you're, you've gone too far, I think. All right. You know what? I think that's a good place to end it. I, my throat is killing me. I've talked too much, <laughs> and I got to go. So thanks so much for hanging around for this 200th episode. I'm kind of surprised by how uh, 
not non-eventful and normal this 200th episode was not surprised it makes sense it's gonna keep going i look forward to celebrating episode 300 with you and then 800 and then 3000 so i've got plenty more in me if you'll keep coming back i'll keep showing up all right that's it have a good one see ya